Hello and welcome to the Alcohol-Free Lifestyle podcast. I'm Victoria English, head coach at Alcohol-Free Lifestyle, and I have a question for you. Did you go to college before social media was a thing? Keep your hand up. Raise your hand if you did. Raise your hand if you're also really glad that your escapades back in those days were not recorded and posted. Exactly. Today we are talking about the science of sensitivity. Why alcohol makes us overly emotional. So if your hand stayed up, it's possible that some of those things that thankfully weren't recorded included some, uh, let's just say, dis emotional dysregulation. That's a nice way of saying some unbecoming behavior. We're going to talk about the science of why. So, okay, we got away with it when we were younger. Whew, thank goodness. Hopefully with minim minimal to no consequences. Now, if you're like me, you're in smack dab in middle age. I turned 54 soon. And if you're listening, chances are you're 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. And so it's not a good look. And it can cause a lot of emotions afterwards. And so in this episode, my goal is to empower you with science. That's really the foundation of our methodology here at Alcohol Free Lifestyle, is to be empowered, enlightened through science so that you can make choices for yourself instead of alcohol making choices for you. So we're going to cover several things in this episode. I'm going to start with alcohol in the brain, just some basics. Then we're going to move into the limbic system, which is the emotional center of the brain. We're going to talk about alcohol's role in memory and stress response, emotional hangovers and long-term effects, and why some people seem to be more affected than others. All right, let's get started. I'm so glad you're here. I love this stuff. <laughs> and you know, part of why I love this so much is because when I figured this stuff out, and gosh, back then, we didn't have all these podcasts with this in information. So I'm so glad that we can package it for you guys. But when I found out these sorts of things, it was the beginning of releasing a lot of the shame and embarrassment around the things that I said and did, the things I didn't say and didn't do back in my drinking days, right? I used to joke that I spearheaded the mommy wine movement. Ha ha. Yeah, that went really well. Anyway, uh, wasn't so proud of some of my behavior and uh, learning about the science really helped empower me. And then, of course, learning about the power I had to, to heal my brain, support my body and brain so that it could heal from the effects that um, had taken place while during my drinking career. All right, so let's get started. Basics around alcohol in the brain. Alcohol is a depressant. That doesn't mean that it makes you depressed, but it slows down brain function by affecting our neurotransmitters. Two of the most important transmitters are GABA, which is GABA amino butyric acid, and that's inhibitory, meaning it calms the brain down, and glutamate, which is excitatory, ex excitatory. Yes, that's a big word, excitatory. What that means is it is it makes us more alert. And so it's a funny seesaw, isn't it? Um, you know, when we have those first couple of drinks, and this is part of the reason that you find yourself keep going, keeping the returning to drinking, is when the GABA activity is increased, you feel relaxed, you feel disinhibited, and even euphoric. At the same time, it decreases glutamate, 
and that can make us slower to react and less able to think critically. That sounds, it can feel good in the beginning, except that's all kind of, that's kind of happening, you know, during those first few drinks, right? And that's what we keep going back to, trying to capture that feeling, especially for, for our high achievers, right? You guys have really busy, busy brains and it's natural that you want something to turn it down. And it does appear, you know, that those couple of drinks are a good time, except what happens next? These shifts lead to less control over our emotions as inhibitions are lowered. You guys know when this starts to happen, be honest. Well, maybe you're not aware of it, but in hindsight, you know, right? And we can certainly observe it in other people. So because the prefrontal cortex is affected and that's responsible for things like decision-making, emotional regulation, impulse control, um, that's when things can start to get a little dicey and emotions can start to run a little bit wild. Next, we have the limbic system. Now, that's what we call the emotional center of the brain. I've actually been studying this quite a bit. And that's the part of the brain that really, really starts to light up when you've had a few drinks. It's in the midbrain. And so, you know, first you get that nice relaxing buzz. The prefrontal cortex is turned down. Um, it, you know, it doesn't always go great. That's also the point where you lose the choice sometimes like, ah, I was going to go home after an hour. It's fine. I'll just, you know, I'll go home later. I'll go home in an hour or two. And then you go home four hours later, right? It's also the point where people can choose to get behind the wheel. Yeah, even after two drinks, you are impaired. And so, you know, if you have all your wits about you, you would not drive with any sort of drug in your system. But uh, it just goes to demonstrate that people, even people who do not uh, struggle with alcohol use disorder or maladaptive drinking uh, can get into some trouble just from those couple of drinks. And so then we go into, like I said, the midbrain, the limbic center. And boy, oh boy, by about drink three, you know, depending on the size of your drinks, I don't think any of you guys are actually measuring your wine ounces. I sure wasn't. Um, that's when things get a little, a little crazy. So your prefrontal cortex is dulled. The limbic system gets more freedom to act without its usual constraints. That's when people start to say what's really on their mind. It may not be really what's on their mind, but you know what I'm saying, right? You become loose-lipped. Maybe you become snarky. Maybe someone who isn't even looking at you um, is annoying you because you think they're giving you some sort of look. We've seen it happen. Pair that with the activity that's going on in the amygdala, the increased activity in the amygdala. What's the amygdala? Well, that's the part of your brain that is responsible for processing some of our more, I like to call them primitive emotions, fear, anger, sadness. So normally without alcohol, you know, little, little, ebbs and flows in emotion may not be that noticeable and we may be able to brush them off. So if you think someone's looking at you, you might just go, oh, I, I don't know if they're looking at me or not. It doesn't really matter, right? Or um, whatever the case may be. Someone says something and you're like, well, pff, that, was kind of, uh, that was kind of rude. Um, they're not brushed off. They can feel a lot more intense. So it's not that your feelings are not valid. They are. It's just that they're amplified and magnified because of what alcohol has done to your brain. Starting to put together some pieces, aren't you? Oh, if I'd only known this <laughs> in my 30s and early 40s. Whew. Anyway, it's okay. I'm here now and I get to share this with you all. So next we move into alcohol's role in memory and stress response. 
So another thing that's impacted is cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Alcohol affects the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, known as the HPA, which controls the release of cortisol. Now, while alcohol can temporarily reduce stress, it disrupts how we process stress afterwards. Stay with me here. As your brain starts to feel less in control and more overwhelmed, emotional reactions, like becoming overly sensitive, are much more likely. And so you see the rabbit hole that we're going down, right? We are elevating those stress hormones, the amygdala, the more, more you know, primitive part of our brain is in overdrive. The prefrontal cortex, the part that goes, dude, just don't, it's not that big a deal. That thing is turned way down by this point. And the emotional center of the brain is running wild running the show. It's not a good look. And sadly, it leads to so many problems. I wish more people knew this and I, and, and look, we're making progress, but man, I really wish more people knew this so that they could make informed decisions. Now let's talk about the morning after. Ay, ay, ay. How many times have you woken up and thought, how much trouble am I in this time? How many times have you picked up your phone and looked at your text messages and said, I did not actually send that? And how does that make you feel? I know how it made me feel. It was awful. It might have been the worst part of the whole cycle, right? Because those, think of what we're trading for that little brief time of feeling the, ah, the exhale, right? Where the prefrontal cortex is turned down just enough that we're not feeling as stressed. At what cost? What is that costing you? Because you can afford two drinks right? And that's about what it takes. Two drinks to turn it down. Except if you're listening to the podcast, <laughs> chances are you don't stick to two drinks, right? You wouldn't, you'd be listening to something else if you could stick at the one or two drinks. And I'm talking about a drink, not what we, what we decide is a drink. Five ounces of wine is a drink. One beer is a drink. 1.5 ounces of liquor is a drink. So, you know, one or two of those, at what cost? You've got the money. Do you have the fortitude to keep going on with this? Do you? So let's talk about that next day, the emotional hangovers and the long-term effects. So, yeah, we talked about the morning after. Oof. Not only that, You've got the actions that you have to deal with, right? And your mood and emotions are not stable. So you've got all the shame and everything else, but you've also got the anxiety, you know, the anxiety, the hangover anxiety. Even though the alcohol has left your system and you may you know, be able to safely drive, maybe not as safely because you probably didn't sleep well. By the way, cortisol is very counterproductive when we are trying to manage a healthy weight and it impacts our sleep. So just a little side note there. It's a good feeling to get that one under control. Anyway, um, part of the reason this is, is because your serotonin which is another key neurotransmitter for regulating mood, is all messed up, right? The levels go up when you're drinking, then they dip really low. Your brain is scrambling, trying to bring it up to a healthy level, maintain homeostasis. 
And as your time, as time goes by and you continue to drink, it gets harder and harder and more and more of a futile effort on your brain's part to bring that serotonin up to a healthy level. And so even after the hangover is gone, the emotional hangover may not be. <clears throat> like I said, you can feel really down and moody. Now, what's that make you want to do? You've got the shame from the night before. You've got the anxiety. You've got the, the low mood. You feel blue. You feel embarrassed, ashamed of yourself. Even if nobody saw you, you know, makes you want to drink, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So finally, why are some people more affected than others? There's a few reasons. And the science is, is still new on this stuff, guys. There's a lot to learn. But do you ever wonder why some people become emotional wrecks after just a few drinks and others seem unaffected? Well, some factors that have been identified, um, it starts with genetics. Your sensitivity, sensitivity to alcohol is partly genetic. Some people's brains are just more reactive to the neurotransmitter shifts that alcohol creates. That being said, even if you are not predisposed genetically to that, you can acquire that sensitivity. And so something to consider. So that's why you may find that maybe when you were younger, you didn't have such emotional swings while drinking, and now you do. Also, personality and mood. Your, your pre-drinking mood pays, plays a huge role. If you're already stressed out or anxious or upset, chances are alcohol is going to amplify those emotions. So if you're drinking to relieve stress, let's say you go in to have a few drinks because you are angry with a coworker. And it's, man, it's just gnawing at you. You are annoyed. And you go to unwind with a few drinks. How do you think that's going to go? What are the odds <laughs> that you're going to tell either text or email or if that person is there, you're going to tell them what you really think of them? How about family events? We've got the holidays coming up. Uh, yeah. How does Thanksgiving dinner go when there's family tension and alcohol's introduced? How are those civil conversations, right? Now, look, sometimes we deal with people that we may not gel with, and they can be blood. They could be lots and lots of, they can play lots of different roles in our lives. It is what it is, right? But is alcohol really going to help? Can you think of a time where you've been drinking to quell some of those emotions and it's gone well? <laughs> Can you? Right. Additionally, tolerance. If you drink regularly, you might build a tolerance to some of alcohol's effects, but that doesn't mean you're not emotionally affected. And so this is interesting because sometimes people who are regular drinkers become more emotionally numbed in general, and they are still prone to unpredictable outbursts when those emotions break through. I, I experienced this personally, and I have worked with many, many clients who have shared this as well, that they were drinking to kind of numb out. And sometimes it would work. Sometimes they would be in just that, that flatness, that escape, except for that time. Oof, and that other time. Remember that? Yeah. And so, you know, guys, again, we can joke about when we were younger and the silly things we did and maybe crying with our, with our friends over a breakup. I know I did, you know, over some drinks. Okay. Is that what 
you want to be doing now? Do you really want at your age and at your level of success and what's on the line, do you really want to hand the, key, the keys to your life over to alcohol and just see what happens? You know, it's like a reckless teenager being in control of your life. Think about it, right? Teenagers, their prefrontal cortex isn't fully formed. They lack, to some extent, emotional regulation. So do you want a teenager making choices for your adult life when it comes to that? I don't think so. So it goes back again to that question of sustainability. Is it sustainable or is it possible that you could learn to achieve that relaxation that alcohol promises, that you can turn down your prefrontal cortex in a healthy way with no consequences, that you can learn to tolerate uncomfortable emotions and eliminate all those consequences and all those risks. I mean, come on guys, we're adults. We've got, we've got big lives. One wrong move and that teenage brain, we basically assume when we're drinking, can cause irreparable harm. And so remember, if you've become overly sensitive, emotional, reactive after drinking, it's not the alcohol talking, it's your brain chemistry going through some serious shifts. Alcohol lowers our inhibitions. Okay, maybe we're a little more friendly that first or second drink, but it also magnifies those emotions that we are avoiding, that we don't want to put on display by affecting the critical parts of the brain. Like I said, like the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. And so now during this moment of clarity, while you listen to this podcast, I'm going to ask again, is it sustainable? Is that how you want to show up in the coming weeks, the coming months? How about the holidays? How do you want to show up in 2025? Let's grow up and actually have a good time doing it. Like James says, he's lived with alcohol and without it. And it's a whole lot better on this side. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be making such a big deal about all this. So go ahead. If your habits aren't sustainable, make a change. Book your free discovery call, 15 minutes. You'll speak with one of our coaches. Let's see if we're a fit. We might not be, but just the act of booking the call and having a conversation is a huge deal. And it could put you on the path to exactly where you belong. And we'd love to find out if, if we are where you belong. Until next time, take good care of you and have an awesome day.